have the privilege of introducing some of our speakers uh, this afternoon. Our first speaker is Rosalind Kirkell. She is a Holocaust educator and presenter. She was the youngest in a family of three children. But by the time the, uh, the Holocaust was over, she was the only child left, a Jewish child survivor. <coughs> As a storyteller and speaker, she dramatizes true stories to help people understand and remember the Holocaust, the most evil event of the 20th century, the mother of all genocides. She has been featured in the Denver Post, the Rocky Mountain News, Intermountain Jewish News, and the National Public Radio, among others. Seventy years after the end of the Holocaust, the survivor community is growing smaller each year as most people are passing away. Has the world changed? Has it become a better place to live? So Roslyn will do a presentation for us today entitled Lessons of the Holocaust. Please help me in welcoming Roslyn Kirkell. World War II and the Holocaust officially ended in 1945 in Europe. My father was on a death march from Dachau concentration camp and nearly nearing death when American soldiers intercepted the death march in Tutzing, Germany. My father spent months in the hospital, but by the end of the year, with hope in his heart, he began his journey back to Lithuania, Shaole, Lithuania, hoping that he would find his little girl, Rosalind, me, still alive. I didn't recognize him. I'd been apart for a few years. I put my arms around my hiding mother, Elena, and said, don't let that stranger take me. Don't let the stranger take me away. But he did. We took our journey and returned to Feldafing Displaced Persons Camp in southern Germany, in Bavaria. Three years earlier, my brother Leib, at the age of four, was taken away to Auschwitz during a children's action in the ghetto we lived in, in Lithuania, in Shaole. My sister Leia, at the age of 10, in July 1944, along with my mother, who was then 36, were put on a train also to Auschwitz to their death. In 1946, my father and I was all that was left of our family. In time, he remarried, so I would have a mother to look after me. And in 1949, the three of us boarded the General Muir, American naval vessel, and crossed the Atlantic to a land with, of liberty and freedom. And we got to Boston Harbor, my father kissed the ground he walked on. It's now 70 years since the end of the Holocaust and World War II. What has the wor world learned? What lessons have the world has been learned or should have been learned by the world? To remember victims, six million Jewish victims, a million and a half of them children from Europe. They were humiliated, demonized, dehumanized, murdered. They were ordinary people, run-of-the-mill people. They had names. 
identities, universes, dreams. My mother had a dream. In 1939, she left my sister Leah with her sister and went for about six months to Kovno, a bigger city in Lithuania, to become a hairdresser. When she came back, she and my father, a barber, opened up a beauty and barber shop. They were just a young family. They had dreams. Lesson two, honor survivors. We who survived, survived with scars. It was the most inhumane, greatest inhumanity of the 20th century. But we had hope and in rebuilding our lives, restored our faith in humanity. Wherever we went, what country, what state, what community, we tried to make contributions for a better world and said never again, never again, never again. Lesson three, recognize with gratitude rescuers, those who risk their lives to save lives, Jewish lives, other lives. You may have heard of Raoul Wallenberg. A diplomat from Sweden, not Jewish, who in 1944 went to Hungary and saved more lives than any government or any organization, but never to be heard from again. We don't know what happened to him. Seventy years later, we struggle to understand how an advanced country like Germany and its collaborators could have implemented the most brutal and barbaric, barbaric ideology. How hundreds of years of human progress yielded, yielded such massive horror. It was attitude, attitude. Attitude is the basis, the genesis of any and all holocaust, any, any or all genocides. In Germany, it was state-sanctioned, sponsored, anti-Semitic anti hate, virulent hate that in the 1800s became racial. And then in 1933, came Adolf Hitler with the final solution. <laughs> the belief, the ideology, that the Aryan race was the superior race over all others no matter what. Jews, inferior, subhuman, scapegoated, blamed for anything and everything. Jews who fought in World War I and earned iron crosses for bravery for the fatherland. Who helped advance science and medicine. Who contributed to literature, to philosophy, to music, to culture, and only made up less than 1% of the population of Germany. Life not worthy of life. What does that mean? That children who were considered defective, adults who were mentally or physically disabled or those in institutions were put into ambulances with Cyclone B to breathe that gas as they were driven around until they, their cries, their whines, their desperation ran out and they died. 
Letters were sent home to family. Sorry, your loved one passed away from a disease or an illness. Sometimes they included universal ashes. Jewish children and old people were considered useless eaters. Let me give you an example. November 28, 1944, two months before Auschwitz-Birkenau was liberated, the infamous Dr. Joseph Mengele received a request from a colleague, SS physician Kurt Heismeyer, mayor, asking him to send specimens for his infectious disease research at the Noengamai concentration camp near Hamburg. Mengele selected 20 normal, healthy Jewish children, 10 girls and 10 boys between the ages of 6 and 12. When they arrived to Nuangami, they were given, they were infected with tuberculosis bacteria. And for several months, they were watched as they struggled, as they struggled with the symptoms of tuberculosis. Then they were taken to a schoolhouse. Hooks were put into the walls, pounded into the walls. The children were given morphine and hung from their skin on the hooks to die. Eight days later, the British Allied forces came to liberate. Too late for these children. The genocide of European Jews succeeded not only because of the of the industrial killing machine, but also because of the indifference and inaction of world leaders. The magnitude is unbelievable. In 1938, at Lake Geneva, Switzerland, the Evian Conference was held, where world leaders came together. Yes, President Roosevelt and Churchill and others. And yes, there were those who did open their doors for some desperate Jews in 1938. In 1938, the St. Louis, both left with nearly a thousand people desperate to leave the continent, Germany for sure. They'd pay their last of their money, nickels and dimes, to be saved. And they, it went to Cuba, but Cuba did not let them in. America did not let them in, and they returned to Europe where nearly 300 of them were murdered in the Holocaust. And later, in the 1940s, when the killing machine was ramped up to 24-7, 24-7, hardly a country on the planet opened its doors for Jews. What else contributed? <coughs> to that genocide, the mother of all genocides, the complicity of professional people. Who, you wonder? Doctors, nurses, medical people, attorneys, architects, engineers, church leaders, educators, teachers, all contributed. To the madness. Ordinary people 
became Hitler's willing executioners. And the unspeakable crime of the 20th century was the sin of the innocent bystander. The innocent bystander, what is that? What is that? You've probably heard of uh, some of the camps. Um, Auschwitz-Birkenau, Treblinka, <coughs> Medonic, others. But what we just learned 70 years later in the recent months is the researchers at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. have unearthed astonishing evidence that there were really 42,500 concentration camps and ghettos throughout Europe between 1933 and 1945. Unfathomable. What, on every corner? How could anybody be innocent of knowing that or smelling the human flesh? It couldn't be. It couldn't be innocent bystanders. Let me break this down. 30,000 slave labor camps, 1,150 Jewish ghettos, 980 concentration camps, 1,000 prisoner of war camps, 500 brothels, thousands of other camps. Where does that leave us today? What is happening today? Antisemitism is rearing its ugly head again? We said never again? Genocides, massacres, beheadings, terrorism in Australia, in Europe, in Africa, in the Middle East. What can we do? We must do something. Each one of us. I was talking to a lady just a little bit ago. She has a program about the Holocaust a, a a, a, on the internet and several thousand people, people want to know. We need to know, more people need to. I speak to many groups. I hope each of you has some way, something that you can do, speak up, write, learn, share, demonstrate, you, you decide. Erwin Kotler, Canadian Member of Parliament, former Canadian Justice Minister, writes in the Jerusalem Post. We will speak up. We will act against racism, against anti-Semitism, against mass atrocity, against injustice, and against the crime of crimes, whose name we should shudder to mention genocide. Never again will we see evil and stand idly by. Avner Shelley, Chairman of Yad Vashem, in his keynote address at the United Nations International Day this last January 2020, said, Our world is plagued with cruel conflicts for dominance and resources. In the shadow of those conflicts, we can and must educate the next generation of citizens and leaders to choose to behave ethically, humanely, I call on all fellow educators in every corner of the world to strive and persevere in our constant battle for human morality. The power of one. Thank you.
Oh, oh, oh.